Hi, everybody. We really welcome you here to the broadcast today. We're excited that you're with us, and we hope that this would be a, a turning point in your life. We really are praying for you, and we know that this is going to be one of the best days of your life because I know that the Lord loves you and that he's with you. So join with me in prayer today as we just ask the Holy Spirit to guide everything that we do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing it is to come here. May the words that I share today, may everything that I say, Lord, be acceptable and be pleasing to you. May I share your heart with people, Lord, and may they understand your ways. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much. I want to start by just sharing with you a very important key thing about how God himself is turning in this hour that we live in. He's turning our trials into trophies. And I want you to just log in with me today and see that the word of God bears witness with this. In 2 Peter 1, verses 2 through 4, God has said he's granted us precious and magnificent promises so that by them we may be a partaker of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt, I am so convinced that this is the hour that God is changing us, that he's turning us into the victorious leaders that God has called us to be. You know, most of the time when we're praying, we're praying and asking God, God, get me out of this trouble. But the miracle is that God actually is more concerned about our journey than our destination. When God comes in, in a situation and gives us his favor and his grace and it will cause us to outlast all the persecution and all the tribulation that we may be going through. When that happens and God changes the inside of us, everything, everything will bust loose. So when God walks into your situation, you can be in his divine order and your steps can actually be ordered of the Lord. And my prayer for my life right now during this time is, oh, Jesus, Jesus, keep me in the moment. I want to live with my eyes wide open because I don't want to miss what you have for me right now. Really, it's the truth because we're so used to fighting everything, fighting it off, fighting it off. And what God says right now is focus on what God wants to do inside of you. You see, we can grow through the situation not just go through the situation. We can grow through the situation. And God works in us to put in us his divine nature through the great and precious promises that cause us to be a partaker of his very divine nature, his, his attitudes. Because you see, our attitude will determine our altitude in life. And so when we concentrate on those things that remain, the Bible says, these are the three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. And by the way, he says the greatest of these is love. When we focus on these things, God will work in us something that is of great value and will remain for an eternity. Glory to God. Something that's so powerful that it'll remain for an eternity. And I'm always interested in what God can do in me before I focus on what can God do through me. So the truth is, and this is the fact, this is the truth, God delights in you. I want you to get that today. I want you to see it, feel it, smell it, taste it, enjoy it. God delights in you. In fact, in Hosea 2, verse 14, God says about his children, about his people, I will, I will allure her or bring her into the wilderness and there... I will speak comfortably to her, giving her hope. So when you're going through stuff that's pretty tough, tough, I call it tough stuff. When you're going through tough stuff, that's when God will allure you into the wilderness and he'll ask you to invite him into your difficulty, to your problem, to your situation. Because when that happens and you invite him in, everything changes. God doesn't say that adversities won't come. 
What he says, though, is that he wants to walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death so that you will fear no evil. You see, I am convinced that you are becoming that victorious leader that God wants you to be. He's calling you into something greater than yourself. He's making you into something that can change this world. You have a destiny, a destiny of greatness. You have a destiny in God that will change this whole world. I know you don't see yourself like that right now, but God does. God does. He sees you. He sees you just like, just like a precious, beautiful, anointed, valuable channel of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you face difficulties, this is the situation. When you're facing mistreatment and persecution, and even when you're facing temptations, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add that in because this is the truth. When you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, this is what God is inviting you to do. Invite God into your situation and say, God, change me. In 1 Samuel 1, verses 1 through 20, now there was a certain man from, Am- from Ramathiam Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penaniah. And Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. She was fruitless. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. And when the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penaniah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. You see, God loves you. And he sees your situation. He understands that it's difficult. And he wants to give you revelation. You see, whenever you go through difficulties, the first thing you should ask God for is God Almighty. I am your teachable one. And I ask you to give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you so that the eyes of my heart would be opened to the hope of my calling. What are you doing in my life, Lord? Instead of always pushing away all the difficulties, say, what can I do in this moment? And what are you showing me? And so when the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly because of the other wife in the situation. Thank God we don't have that anymore. Hallelujah. Poor guys have just one to deal with, right? So... God said this was a situation that really, really bothered, bothered Hannah. It was a mistreatment. She was being abused. And God loved Hannah. And it happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she, she would provoke her. In other words, this other wife would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Thank God she had a good husband. All right, someone who really loved her. But nevertheless, she was fruitless. And I want you to understand, you may have a lot of things going for you, but there is one area that may be provoking you, one area of your life that may be causing you to really be grieved inside. And I believe through what we're going through in this hour, there are many things that may be coming to your mind. Maybe an area where it deals with your children or maybe an area where it deals with your your spouse or with your job or maybe a sickness, a virus, disease, whatever it may be. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you're looking for something that you haven't seen yet. Well, in the midst of this, remember this. God is interested in that. He loves to bless you. In fact, David said, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. Who He actually, he forgives all of our sins. He heals all of our diseases. He crowns our life with loving kindness. He redeems us from destruction. All these things are benefits of the Lord and we need to walk in those and believe for them. I am a firm believer in that. But I'm also 
very interested in one thing more than anything else, and that's pleasing Jesus. I want desperately to please him with my heart. I want my life to be a reflection of his love. I want my life to be a reflection of his glory and of his goodness to everyone that I touch, you in particular. I want you to know how much I love you. And this is why I'm doing this. I want to help you. I want you to become stronger, more powerful, greater inside, to see that the greater one lives within you and that he can cause us to change in our attitudes, in our outlook on life, in the way we treat people and the way we honor God. Those are the issues that God's looking for. In this hour, the greatest commandment that he ever gave the church was to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor even as ourselves. And so I'm really interested in this. I really want to see this thing, this commandment that God gave us, which by the way was the only thing he asked us to do. I want to see this commandment come alive. I want to see it vibrant. I want to see it living and active and, and powerful in me and in you. And I'm inviting you today to come in asking the Lord into your situation, into your mistreatment, into your misunderstandings, and say, God, how? How do you want me to respond? And so look at here. Elkanah, her husband, said, Hannah, I love you so much. Am I not better? Why don't you forget about this? Nevertheless, Hannah had a destiny, and you have a destiny too. You, my friend, have a destiny in God, and I want to help you walk in that destiny. Then Hannah rose up after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest, <clears throat> he was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple, and she, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord. And she wept bitterly. And she made a vow and said, O Lord, if you indeed would look upon the affliction, the persecution, the tribulation, and that's what you're going through today also. She prayed, God, if you would look upon this situation, I'm inviting you in, God. And if you would remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son. Or in other words, Lord, give me fruit. Give me fruit. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. And it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that here's another whammy. We had Penaniah come at her with a mistreating attitude. And here now we have Eli. And you're talking about the pastor here, okay? And Eli was watching her mouth. And as for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Here it is, a misunderstanding. And they all come. They come to us all in every way, shape, form, fashion, in everything, in all of life, offenses will come. In fact, in the end times, the Bible says, in the end times, in the last days, that offenses will rise and many will be offended and literally betray one another. And so I'm really concerned about the love walk. I'm really concerned about us walking in the glory of love that God has for us, not only love for God, but love for others and how to handle being mistreated. So Eli thought she was drunk, and here she was, just trying to seek after God. And Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Once again, she could have been offended by that, gravely. Put away your wine from you. But Hannah was a very meek lady. She had humility. And Hannah said, no, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of great concern and provocation. And then Eli, he repented, he recanted, and he said, go in peace, and may the Lord of Israel grant your petition. Notice how she handled her mistreatment. It was with meekness. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when we walk in humility, when we're being, being mistreated, God will redeem you. And what happened was that woman went away, Hannah, and she ate, and her face was no longer sad. 
And it says it came about in due time. Notice God has a due time. He's got a set time for every miracle for you. In due time, after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to fruit, fruitfulness, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I've asked him of the Lord. And I'm concerned right now today for you. I believe that God wants you to invite him into your mistreatment especially in the area of misunderstandings that you've gone through and maybe even a misunderstanding that you have with God. And I say this, I say this very, very gravely, but I also want to tread on some soil here because a lot of times we misunderstand the dealings of God, the judgments of God, the, the, the leadership of God Almighty, and we back away and we say, I'm either unworthy or God's missed it or we get angry with God, we fall away. And you know what? None of that, none of that was in the life of Joseph. Look at how many times he could have had chances to get offended, not only at God, but at people. He could have been offended many times. Offended, God, you gave me this vision and now I'm in a pit. And then to boot after that, he got carried away and be put in a prison but God had a palace destined for him. He had, a, he had a, a due time in his life, and you too have an appointed time. And God says, if you would come unto him, invite him in, and say, oh Lord, help me, help me in this situation, God will do something fantastic for you. You know what he'll do? He'll turn your adversity into a stepping stone do, 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 for your purpose. For the anointing of God is with you, just like it was with Joseph. So you can come out of your confusion and begin to rest today and understand that your purpose is right now to show God that you trust him. No, no, it's not to get mad at God. You see, there is a time and season where I could have easily gotten mad at God in many situations where I was mistreated. As a woman in ministry, over many years there have been times, or even in the situation, in a church situation where people misunderstand you. But you know what? I just don't even do it. I just say in my heart, I'm not going to take that bait that Satan has put as a trap right there. You see, the bait of Satan is a trap, and I'm not going to bite the bait and get confused, get offended, and get off course. And I don't want you to get off course either. That's why I'm saying that even if it doesn't work out your way, even if you don't get your say, my mother-in-law used to always say, if I don't get my way or my say, at least I want God to have his way. And when you come before God and say, God, I accept your dealings. I accept your judgments. I accept your leadership. I want to walk in the way everlasting. I'm going to submit knowing that due time is coming. Even if you don't do it my way, God, I'm going to do what you ask. I'm going to love the unlovable. I'm going to keep a sweet spirit. I'm going to help people. And I'm sharing this with you today because I know some of you are experiencing a tremendously bad marriage or experience with your son or daughter where they've mistreated you. You've gone through difficulties, maybe even hurt so much to the point, and I will say this, maybe even to the point of suicide, and I want you to understand, I love you, and God loves you, and he's got something for you that's far better than you could ever dream. Just invite him in. Invite him into your life. Invite him into your heart. Invite him into your mistreatment. And do what the word says, Say, Jesus, and Jesus will do this, when you ask him to show himself to you, to teach you his ways, like David says, Lord, search my heart. Try me, Lord. See if there be any wicked way and lead me in the way everlasting. Be my guide. God will show you the path and it may go to the lowest place but, you know, as water goes to the lowest place, so too the Holy Spirit, who's like living water, goes to the lowest place. But eventually, when you humble yourself and submit in obedience to Jesus, 
God will lift you up. God comes into that fire. He comes into that situation. Do you know when Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were in the midst of the fiery furnace, do you know what burned off of them? The only thing that burned off of them was what held them into bondage. And see, when, when you invite God into your life, he'll be with you in the middle of that fiery trial, in the midst of that situation, and he will say, I am come to help you to understand, first of all, my dealings and how I love you and how I want to bring you into the very best. Even if it's a little bit off course, in due time, God says, I will show you I will bring the pattern out, the pattern of beauty in all things. I see these foxhole prayers that we pray, you know, God, get me out of this situation and I'll always worship you. You know, the foxhole prayers, they're okay. And sometimes God really does honor them. But let's wade a little deeper right now. As the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, God wants to make you into a leader. He wants you to make you into a historical, life-changing leader in this hour. And leadership has to go through some hard knocks in order to learn obedience. You see, Hebrews chapter five, verse eight says this, Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Check it out. Jesus, I'm talking about the son of God. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So where does that leave us? It leaves us in the very same situation. In fact, God's looking for a people, a non-compromising church, a church that's willing to say yes to God and not compromise. There's no room for compromise any longer. There's no, there's no time for that. God, God is, is preparing a bride. He's preparing a church. He's preparing sons and daughters that are going to say, God, whatever you say, I trust you. I trust your leadership. I'm willing to make the adjustments. And I believe that in this hour, God is speaking to the compromised church. And he's saying in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 12, for I do not want you to be unaware I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud. That means they had a spiritual anointing. They were walking in the cloud like I preached on before. They all ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock. Nevertheless, God said, most of them God was not well pleased with and they were laid low in the wilderness. It doesn't say they weren't saved. And I want to I want to clear this up right now. God loves all of his children. He blesses all of his children. He encourages his children. And in fact, we need to be encouraged daily, the Bible says, for this is the will of God. Lest we what? Lest we be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You see, sin will harden us. It'll cause us, and I'm talking about compromise in every area. It causes us to not want to see Jesus as being loving and kind, like he is. And so that's why encouragement needs to come daily. It's a sandwich. You see, I call it the encouragement sandwich. But the encouragement sandwich also includes correction. It's like the bread is the encouragement, and the center, the meat or the cheese or whatever you have, in the center is the correction and the bottom layer is the bread. It's called a correction sandwich. And God is giving that out to his church right now. He's saying, I want you to know how much I love you. I want you to know I'm gonna allure you into this wilderness and speak comfortably to you. I'm gonna speak kindly to you. But I also want you to speak up, turn your ears towards me and listen to me because I'm speaking. And God wants us to obey him. If we want to please God, if we really love God, if we really love God, and it's not about our own agenda, our own life, then we'll want to be well-pleasing to him. Look at this. It says, most of them God was not well-pleased with. You see, when our heart is given over to God, we're saying, Lord, I want to please you. I want to trust your leadership. I want, to, I want to have faith that moves mountains. I want to have love so strong that if people oppress me and they throw rocks at me and through my window, I'm just going to smile on through. I'm going to just, 
I'm going to love them nevertheless because I know how you love me. And when we know how God loves us, we can respond to mistreatment in a very honorable way. But look at, nevertheless, most of them God was not well pleased with, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happen, though, to us, and God's giving us a clue phone here. They happened as examples for us that we would not crave evil things as they craved. Do not be idolatrous as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. So there he's addressing idolatry and he's addressing it to the compromised church. He says, don't do it. It's not gonna pan out. <laughs> Besides that, it's not, it's not really respectful to God. Now let me, let me tell you something. If I, and I do have a beautiful daughter, but if I would always constantly tell her that I'm gonna be there for her, I'm gonna help her, uh, she, all she needs to do is trust me, and she would walk around, and she would do something her way, and always do things her way, and always want her ideas, it would be like a slap in my face. It would be like I would think she doesn't really trust me. Well, you see, it's no different. God is looking for obedience in his children. He wants us to obey, not out of legalism, but out of a willing heart, out of a heart that says, God, you've done so much. You're so kind. You're so good. You've got good things planned for me. And that kindness of the Lord, you see, leads us to repentance where we say, yeah, what was I thinking? I'm sick and tired of being this. I don't want that anymore in my life. I want to get it out, okay? Because there's all kinds of compromise the church may have. Look at this. It says, and immorally they acted as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by this destroyer. I'm telling you, that's an interesting thought there about grumbling. How many times do we grumble when the Lord is dealing with us and we don't understand it? It's a grumbling spirit. Oh, no, 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 no. Give him praise. Honor God. Honor him. I'm telling you, there's nothing that God likes more than when we tell him this. God, you're doing a great job. Now, God, I don't understand it. I really don't. And I really don't know how this is going to pan out. But I really honor you in the midst of this. And I trust you that you will make a way where there is no way, that you will show me the way, that you will reveal your truth to me, that you will teach me, that you will show me. If there's any wicked way in me, God, you'll lead me in the way everlasting. And most of all, he wants to tell you this. He wants to enjoy a relationship with you. Ooh, yeah, he loves you so much. He wants to enjoy a relationship with you. And so let's get it settled right now that nothing that you're experiencing, nothing that you're experiencing, no fallout, mistreatment, Nothing is going to keep you from your destiny in God. You might as well just relax and thank God in the midst of it. No complaining. Mm -mm, no complaining. Just, Lord, I worship you. And just smile on through. Lord, I worship you. I don't get it, but I know you got something greater. I know that when I honor you in my problems and I tell you that you're doing a great job, I'm telling you, God is loving that. So the lesson that God has for us, and I'm believing this, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is headed for greatness. But in the midst of it, we're going to have to go through some bumps, some birth pains, and we're going to have to keep a sweet spirit through mistreatment, through our misunderstandings, and even through our temptations. When we're being tempted to compromise, get this, Psalm 85 is so powerful. I was reading this the other day and my daughter gave this word to me and she said, this is a specific word for the church and I do believe that this nation will benefit if we heed this. This is what God is saying, not only to the church, but to the nation. In Psalm 85, it says, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people and you have covered all of their sin. God has literally not just covered it, he's eradicated our sin. 
He's made us so that we do not have to be sin conscious. But I will add this, we do need to be conscious on respecting and honoring God and pleasing him. If we really love him, if we really love someone, we'll want to obey their commands. We'll want to hear his voice. We'll want to listen to him. God, what are you saying? What are you saying to me, Jesus? What is it that I need to do? How do you want me to change? I do want to change, Lord. I want to change from glory to glory. And here, it's so good because the Lord has not only eradicated our sins, but he has taken away his, he's taken away all wrath. You have turned the fierceness of your anger from us. And God says, restore us, O God, of our salvation and cause your anger toward us to cease. Lord, will you be angry with us forever? Will you, will you prolong your anger to all generations? O Lord, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? And God says, this is how it can happen. This is how the life gets changed when we understand God. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of mercy. And he has forgiveness for all those that call upon him with a pure heart. Don't you ever get sick and tired of being sick and tired? Haven't you ever gotten sick and tired of that stupid habit that you're living in? That compromise situation? That area where sin is just plaguing you and, and the distressing situations of life are overwhelming. As the Lord says, either it's idolatry or if it's immorality or might I add, the majority of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is involved in this right now, complaining. God, what's going on? God, what's going on? And we're getting bitter and we even more so are getting offended at what the Lord is wanting us to learn in. He's wanting to teach us something about our character right now. Will we take, will we take the dealings of God in this time and will we say, God, I know that in this situation, I don't really understand everything, but I do know one thing that I'm an owner of. I'm owner of my heart. And God, I wanna deal with my heart. How is my heart responding to you right now? How am I responding to others right now? How am I dealing with people that come at me with injustice? And David said, if you show us your mercy, Lord, Grant us your salvation. I will hear what the Lord God will speak, and he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But, it says, but let them not turn back to folly. And he's making an admonition to you. He's saying, when I speak comfortably to you, when I give you my mercy, don't go back into the ways of the world. Don't, church, don't go back to the culture of, of the world, but take on the culture of the kingdom. It's beautiful. The culture of the kingdom is so beautiful. And so the Lord says, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him and respect him. In fact, that's Jesus said in Hebrews chapter five, God, God, God himself, Jesus himself learned obedience through whatever he suffered. And it says, when Jesus cried out to the Father with strong cries and tears, he was heard by God because he respected God. He feared him. Not in an evil way like I'm cowering in fear. It's in a way in which he respected God. God, I respect you. I know life and death, God, are there. They're out there. And God I don't want to go in the enemy's territory. I respect you that much that I want to avoid the evil and embrace the good. So show me the way everlasting because I am really convinced that the church is so blessed right now. It's so good. It's, I mean, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing, the Bible says, in heavenly places. But the only way that we can receive corruption is if we allow the enemy to come into our heart to corrupt us. If we allow the enemy to come and corrupt us, then we walk right into the enemy's territory through being... Uh, 
un, not understanding how to deal with life, how to deal with our situations, how to allow these things to work good in us. Because God says, I will turn the evil around for good if we let him, if we let him control the situation, if we let him do it. The key is that you invite him in. You let him control the situation. You let him uh, help the injustices be turned around for a great blessing, the Bible says. God will bless you. When mercy and truth come together, righteousness and peace kiss together. Isn't that beautiful? When mercy, mercy, the mercy of God is given to us and we with a truth through a truthful heart inside say, oh God, a truthful heart. Lord, search me. Search my heart. See if there is an wicked way and don't let me hurt myself in this battle. Don't let me hurt myself through ignorance. God, show me your glory. Teach me your ways. Refine my my heart in the process of the fire so that I'm like pure gold because God is giving you character for the call. He's given you an anointing that breaks every chain. The yoke of God, the anointing, the yoke, God says, will destroy the enemy. He will cause everything that is evil to be turned around for good. God says, this is the destiny of the uncompromised church. This is the destiny of you. The church needs to grieve over what it has happened in the past and said, Lord, we have opened the door. We have opened the door to immorality. We have opened the door to compromise, to especially to grumbling. We've just been grumbling, grumbling, grumbling and complaining about your dealings and oh God, forgive us. I'm not going to condone it. I'm going to say that I myself have read over Psalm 85 and I see what happens when truth and mercy mix together, righteousness and peace come together. Truth shall spring up out of the earth. That's what happens. When we let truth come into our heart, show me the way, God. Teach me your way. Show me how I need to change. It's not good enough. It's not good enough the way church has been in the past. I want you to make the church great again. I want you to make me great, Lord. I want you to show me your glory. I want you to continue to move in my life and not be settled and, and settled in ease and, and, and laid back and, and just resting in our laurels, Lord. I want you to rest upon me, oh Jesus. Rest upon the church, oh God. Rest upon the church that we may show the glory of the Lord in this generation. Yes, the Lord will give us good, it says, and our land will yield its increase and righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. And the Lord says, God, if we would call upon the Lord, if we would come to him, just like Gideon, and some of you may be right now hiding like Gideon was in the wine press. You're hiding in your house like every one of us. But God has a destiny for you. God has a purpose. God has a calling. God wants you to know that your heart is his home and it needs to be cultivated right now. Character for the call. And look at when Gideon was hiding, he was called out of that hiding place in Judges chapter seven. For you see, there were too many people at that time to go against the Midianites. The Midianites were like grasshoppers. They were a multitude of people, so many. <laughs> they couldn't even number them, it says. The camels and all such like that. And they literally came into the enemy, the enemy came into Israel and stole, and stole the harvest from Israel every year. So no wonder they were afraid. Ugh. How are we in that area? Are we afraid of what's going on? Are we afraid of the situation? Well, God says this is a time for us to search our heart and to believe that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith and our trust in Almighty God, in his covenant with us, in that covenant of peace that he has established. And guess what? Judges says... Midian was, the Midianites were coming and, 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 ju and, and the judge at the time, which was Gideon, he said, I don't want this whole thing to look like man had done it. And so I'm going to refine the army. So what he did was he took 32,000 men and he refined it. 
and he had only a few left. There were uh, about 1,000, 22,000 had to leave. And then he took those people and he said, I want you to do something now. I want you to go down to the river and I want you to wa- you know, take a drink. And Gideon was watching. And as those men went down, some of them lapped the hand, took their hand and lapped the water with their hand and brought it to their mouth. And God was looking at those folks and he said, I want those. 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 You, you're, you're out there saying, what does that mean? That means those that are willing to submit to the hand of God. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. They're willing to come under covering. They're willing to take the, the anointing of God and say, God, I still need to learn something. I'm still learning. And I need your hand to cover me. I want to submit to you. I want to obey you. It's important characteristic to the call of God, character for the call. God will often use your pastor to tell you something maybe you don't like quite so much, but it's the truth anyhow. And it's important to be mentored by all those that he's put you in uh, authority around. It's really important. And I believe that when you do, life begins to change and you begin to submit to the dealings of God, and God chooses you. He puts his character of obedience in you for the call. And then another part about the story that's so interesting is that they didn't have any weapons in the battle. They had to go down, listen to what God was saying. He said this, take a trumpet, which is the word of your testimony. God says we overcome through the word of our testimony. And then in one hand, take the trumpet, the other, take a broken pitcher, And there was fire in that broken pitcher, and that represents the breaking of our outer man, of our flesh, the submission to God himself and to the will of God in all things. And this, the Bible phrases it as loving our lives and not even considering our life as being important to us. But the will of God is important. The radical obedience to Christ, hallelujah. (laughs) A radical obedience to say, God, not my will, but yours be done. God caused the army. When we get into radical obedience like this, you know what happens? God caused the army to be one against each other, the enemy army, and Paul, like Paul said, he said, Once you die daily and pick up the cross and take up the cross and carry that cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, God says, you will win. You will win. If my people, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. That means to be obedient even unto death and I will give you a crown of life and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and then I will forgive their sins and heal their land. I believe right now that God is speaking to you about the compromise that you've been going through, the lack of faith, the lack of love, the mistreatment that you've gone and you've been offended you are offended. And God says, right now, would you, wherever you're at, hear the words of God speak comfortably to you? And first of all, he's wanting to tell you that he understands, that he's been through every temptation common to man, and he knows. He knows what it's like, and he wants you to really feel this song right now. Would you just, right, whatever we are, wherever you're at, wherever you're, in your living room or in your bedroom or maybe you're walking, I don't know, in the car with your app, I want you to just pause for a few minutes, maybe pull off to the side of the road or just stop in your home and kneel down, and I want you to just pause, and I want you to hear this song. I want you to open your heart and hear this song that the Lord is saying to you. He's saying, I want to show you my mercy. Lord, show me your mercy. So just pause right now and hear the word of the Lord. Lord, you have 
I've been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity. Just no. 
of worship and an attitude of prayer. And I want you to hear this last scripture today in Psalm 139, verse 22, 23. God, search me, O God. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, I thank you that you lead me in the way everlasting. God is leading you. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that you're leading me in the way everlasting, showing me your glory, showing me your your wisdom, I invite you into my situation, Lord, right now. I ask that you be bold and be strong. And help me, Lord. Help me say no to compromise. Help me say no to this, that, the other thing. Every area that's tempting me. And God, I'm going to hear your merciful words. Because God says, I love you. And I'm going to begin to worship you. I'm going to begin to honor you. And thank you that in all things... God, you'll have the preeminence. In Jesus' name, amen. I really love you. Take that to heart today and be at peace knowing that he's heard your prayer. Thanks for joining us. We love you so very much.